Ko and myself were colleagues once upon a time, long, long time ago, where Singapore was still ours and we had a good time in an architecture firm, you know. But since then, uh, I think Singapore has been steadily going downhill. So the issue of income <coughs> equality, um, I think most of our speeches will start to overlap, but I think the four main areas by which really suppresses our income uh, increases the gap and um, you know, replacing uh, citizens are uh, one, the policy on government's perceived policy of wanting to have free competition at all times. Second is uh, globalization, which no other can, nobody in the world can escape from, but what do we do about it, you know? And the FTAs that we've been signing with our neighbors and with faraway friends. Um, and then um, they keep on threatening us uh, if we don't comply to what they tell us to do, the restructural unemployment. Uh, and then the other thing is the issue of workers' rights, right? Workers' rights. Uh, are, we, are we being uh, really stolen of our very birthright? Um, so I'll be referring to a, a bit to DPM Staman's speech at St. Garland Symposium. And uh, right now, uh, our government is cranking up the propaganda, started to come up with a program, so let's, let's talk about it. And through that, they believe that we can't read between the lines, but we can, you know. In fact, this uh, Let's Talk About It program is like, when I watch it, I do not know whether I wanted to cry or to laugh, you know, because it's really, really incredibly comical, yeah. So um, the free competition issue, our government um, acts and then they latch on to big ticket motherhood statements. You know, we need to have free competitions and our economy will be vibrant. But then they, I, I would come out straight, you know. Yeah, by all means, you have free competition. But if you are a civilized society, whatever you act upon, there should be underlying principles. And... And to me, this particular government is not exactly defending the very same principles that Singapore is, has been founded on. Uh, looking back to what uh, late uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, that uh, you know, we are nothing but a small tiny island in a third world scenario. Um, if we do not differentiate ourselves, being corruption free, being efficient, and if we do not uh, defend against corruption, um, and uh, uh, against corruption, we're going to lapse back into a third world scenario, right? And then what is the policy now? The policy now is our government thinks that free ma ma the free market mechanism will just correct itself, you know? If let's say uh, uh, there's uh, one job, 20 people apply, and then you open the doors to every Tom, Dick and Harry in the world, the best person will, not, will get the job. Right? It will be the best that uh, prosper. But that doesn't work so. Because human nature inherent, inherently you know, uh, are imperfect. You know? And then cultural biasness. Not all of us come from a corruption-free country like Singapore. You know? Corruption. Sense. Yeah. And corruption is a way of life uh, amongst our neighbours. Uh, that's how the world works. I myself could not recognise the face of corruption until I went to Dubai in 2004. So me, very naive, naive went out to Dubai. Uh, initially, I was with a Singapore company, uh, went, went out there. It wasn't, the company out there wasn't run by uh, a Singaporean. Then I realised the Singaporeans were all suppressed. Then it culminated to the point where I walked out the office, I refused to work there anymore. Then because I walked out of the office, it sent ripples down to Singapore headquarters and the owner of the company itself called me up, you know. And then after that, they started investigating and realizing that all the people there, the non-Singaporeans, were taking kickbacks. So if, let's say, you're in a workplace and you know that you are a victim of bullying, you know, to me, like having lived through a very corrupt environment that the media is, I can sense what the signs are. Even they are, if you are doing your work well, you think yourself that you're doing your work well, then you realize that, you know. Um, so so and so is still attacking me. I think something has gone wrong already, right? So, <coughs> so um, so right now, our government has uh, been used to the idea that they themselves really genuinely believe that they are infallible. You know that they are, they can never make mistakes. So even after netizens started to dig up issues like fake certificates 
and um, unaccredited universities, degree mills, somehow they simply do not want to uh, recognize that very, very, fa very hard truth fact, you know. Right, so our friend uh, Mr. Zoro Lim can even try to pull a fast one over our eyes <laughs> and start to interchange uh, the definition of unaccredited university versus a degree mill, you know. So that in itself, uh, you know, one principle that they have destroyed, you know, if you want to keep free market, uh, market competition functioning correct, correctly, it should be totally based on merits, right? If you start defending anything which is not merit, uh, mer uh, based on meritocracy, then you are destroying the very same system that you're purporting, right? So from now until the next elections, if our government do not start to uh, get on, uh, embark on a crackdown to really sieve out who these people are, I feel that uh, you can forget about it. The problems will fester. We need to look for better management. Yeah. So globalization and FTA. Yes, we have signed this uh, FTA with ASEAN countries. And then uh, the main crux of it is free movement of labor. Right? Free movement of labor. My husband was stationed in Jakarta year before last. Right, so who was running the office there. So even with this free movement of labor, our interpretation and their interpretation is very different. So now I'm, I'm questioning this fact, right? Um, did you hear about the uh, latest controversy was like, um, we are trying to control the number of Indian professionals here, and then India as a government wanted to sue our government, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, uh, so our government started to defend. Uh, it says that there is free movement of labor, but it never says that it could be uncontrollable 100%, and that's the way it should be, and that's how they run the economy as well. In Indonesia, yes, there's free movement of labor, but if I want to uh, apply for a job at the visa application, they have recently introduced things like I need to go through passing of the Bahasa test to protect their uh, uh, culture, you know. And then part of the visa application, I have to prove why this foreigner, what special skills does she have. So free movement of labor doesn't mean that any Tom, Dick and Harry can take any other job. There's still an underlying criteria. The same goes for Thailand. So for, for Thailand, there's free movement of labor. I can go there. I apply for a visa. They will still be looking at quotas. Every, for every company, 50 Thais to one foreigner. You can just imagine. So if our, our, our government seems to be pulling, uh, like looking the other way, when they see workplaces being dominated by single nationality, a single race, single ethnic group, you know, and sometimes they just don't speak English, and that is wrong, and I don't think that is an FTA requirement, right? <coughs> uh, so what are the practices uh, amongst countries who... Uh, supports uh, free market competition US, for example, but they still have underlying principles. You cannot replace a staff and, uh, with another person and give the other person a lower salary. Here, what is uh, contributing to our spiraling, uh, our salary spiraling downwards is that if somebody comes to your boss and wanting to work for $50 less, they will sack you, you know? So uh, you cannot replace a striking staff because uh, the whole notion of having equitability between employee and employee is still a very cherished um, principle. You know? um, in modern days like this, even in fact part of common law uh, here, a uh, relationship between employee and employee is not a master and slave relationship. It is a relationship of cooperation. Right? In order for me to do a good job, you need to be treating me right in the same time. But somehow, the management culture is more about bullying. <laughs> and uh, guess where that style of, uh, of bullying management culture comes from? Huh? <laughs> yeah. So, cannot the issue of cannot replace staff if the job still exists? Yes, you can let go of people, but if it's only true blue um, downsizing of companies, you know, if that job still exists, you can actually challenge, how come I lost the job and somebody else filled up my post? So all that is not recognized. Our government just looked the other way. Oh, you go take care of yourself. If everything we take care of ourselves, fundamental principles are not even laid out. 
you know, why why do we want to have you around? Why do we pay you millions of dollars, right? Yeah. So um, this issue about cannot replace uh, staff if the job description is still there also applies to very backward countries. You know, like um, like the whole of Middle East is considered not exactly first world, but they have that as part of the labor law, right? So the issue of structural employment, our government keep on saying you have to train, you have to train, you have to train, but we know it that uh, the rest of the world uh, would fake it until they make it. No? <laughs> so uh, liberal intern, uh, immigration policies, internal transfers here, not only they allow anybody from MNC to bring in someone from their sister company out there, it also applies to affiliates. It doesn't have to be a main company. So if this MNC starts off a recruitment agency and call that an affiliate uh, company, so these people who can just walk into Singapore and get a job and without having the job being out in market. You know? So how does that affect us and how does that affect structural employment amongst us? I noticed that we do have recently attracted industry clusters which brings in sunrise jobs oil and gas, uh, chemical processing. Um, these are the only few engineering jobs in the US where you can get paid at about 95,000 US a year as a fresh graduate. But all that, since the companies here, uh, like the um, consultancy, construction management companies are an offshoot of the MNC of India, everything became Indian. That's how you get inter uh, international uh, business hub in Jurong. You, know? you cannot see a Singaporean and then the jobs are not even out there to be advertised to uh, Singaporeans. So, construction industry, there's no quota for construction, shipbuilding and domestic workers. So, in construction industry, we have all been replaced. It is, I, don't, I haven't come across a clock of works or RTO who are Singaporeans. Uh, they're all like Pinoy, Chinese and Burmese. Uh, even if you hold on to a job, most probably you'll be pushed out. You know? So... So that is what that's creating structural unemployment. So what if uh, some miracle happened and a government suddenly has some common sense left in them and saying that you know, we have to reduce our dependency of foreigners and send all these people home. We have been effectively de-skilled you know, by government policies now. Yeah. So uh, I myself complained to TAFEP. Have you all heard of TAFEP? Tripartite? Yeah. Uh, yeah about uh, ICOM, right? So essentially, I was working in Dubai for seven years. There's an Angmore uh, New Zealand guy uh, who's an architect, who's my direct competitor. We have a very rare skill. We do healthcare specializations and labs. So I've been following around because for jobs or for the next project, we'll always be competing against each other. So I went back to Singapore. The whole of uh, Middle East in 2008-2009 collapsed, economically collapsed. So every Tom, Dick and Harry in the world made a beeline to Singapore, right? Made a beeline to Singapore. So when I was out there, I noticed that he has this Arabic, the equivalent of SPG girlfriend. Uh. <laughs> Wherever he goes, this Angmo, he will bring her in uh, as his assistant and she reports directly to him. Yeah? So he came out here as an internal transfer. So he ran back after the economy collapsed. I ran back to Singapore. He ran back to New Zealand. Um, so, uh, for the Ku Te Puat Hospital, um, there was a job opening for a healthcare specialist. Immediately, it was transferred across to uh, ICOM here without the job even going out. And these are all good, high-paying jobs, right? I, I wasn't looking for a job, so I didn't make uh, any fuss out of it. But I noticed immediately after he got the job, he did the same thing. He brought his Arabic flibiti jibit along, you know? So I, I got very upset. Immediately I called, uh, at that point in time, Tafet was taking up a lot of Straits Times, newspaper advertisements, you know, half a page big, you know, you have to report if you think you're discriminated. So I thought, oh, maybe they're doing something about it. So I told Tafet, you know, I've seen this guy doing this many, many times. He does it in other people's country, I don't care. He does it in my country, I'm upset. Because he brings that girl along, you know, is that opportunity is not open to one of us, to our younger ones, to our next generation, who can be a healthcare specialist, you know. So, depriving our own people of pursuing our aspirations, you know. So, Tafet went to look into it. And the next thing I know, they, both of them revised their LinkedIn profile 
and then they say they're back in New Zealand and the next thing I know the economy start picking up in Dubai again so they went back so we are so stupid you know like during an era where there's ample opportunities we give it all away you know we don't take care of our own people you know so I feel that it's a fundamental right for us to have an aspiration in whatever we want to do. If I want to be the clerk of works, if I want to be a contractor or a bricklayer, I should have that first step at that opportunity. <coughs> Not because of some government policies or we have to keep this uh, industry uh, a cluster competitive, you know, and then we have to bring all these people to, to suppress our salaries further. Yeah. So. <coughs> My uh, latest uh, research is actually employment rights. I started to think around what are actually our rights. Then while I was away, I realized that not PAP MPs are all brain dead. Uh, Halima actually did a good job. <laughs> In 2009, I do not know whether you all know about it. Because, okay, how many of you think that we can easily be dismissed or terminated for no reasons at all as long as they pay you uh, your notice period. How many? Almost all. Huh? How many things that if they terminate you or get rid of you, they must have just cause? Oh, interesting. <laughs> so how do you base your understanding from? <laughs> I have a uh, couple of friends uh, when I was with American MNC. Yeah. The secretary actually, she's in the way. One of the managers did quite like that. Mm. Uh, I am aware that you find some experiences in the mm. I did ask her to challenge that, but she can't because of other, uh, other issues, related issues. Uh, for example, I asked her to make sure she tried record of what she uh, meeting minutes and all that that he has said and all that. Uh, some of the things that she is being asked to do. So, those are the things that. Okay, but she managed to make sure that she get back her job, that the harassment stops? No. Yeah. So he still got rid of her, right? Yeah. Uh. She wasn't even there. She don't even dare to go to M1. Uh, is she covered under EA or uh, under common law? Uh, that I'm okay. So uh, we we started off uh, as an independent country. We actually got a better deal then than now. In those days, everybody had healthcare. <laughs> People had pensions. You know. And in terms of employment rights, all of us were covered under statute. That's what the <laughs> so that went on until uh, all this like washing my hands clean and then citizens, you go and go your own way and take care of yourself. I don't really care what happens to you. Happens about 1980s, right? That was when everything started to de destabilize. So apart from CPF and everything else, um, they threw us out. They, they put a cap on who is covered under EA. Uh, the, the cap on salary is actually $2,005. Uh, Recently, that has been re, uh, increased to $4,005. Yeah. So, um, so with that Employment Act, there were two, particularly, two particular clauses that can be read either way. You know. you can be, so it wasn't so clear whether you can be terminated uh, with just cause or with any any reason, including I don't like your nose. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Halima did a good job in 2009. She went through parliament and asked parliament to clarify. You know, uh, These two clauses are not very clear. Can we get it clarified? So it was clarified that if you want to terminate someone, you need to have proper just cause. So those under EA can actually complain to Ministry of Manpower, right? To Ministry of Manpower, and they will um, they will investigate into it. So the uh, remedy will be either compensation, or uh, they will put you back in your same job again. No, but no, ministers no. Uh, ministers' decision is final, which I think. Uh, but then, okay, that is a good step in the right direction. And I believe and gossip on the ground is since Halima spoken up for blue collar workers. They made her Speaker of Parliament, so she cannot champion for any causes anymore. <laughs> and that was how it happened, yeah. So it 
opens the question to the rest of us. What are our rights when we are thrown out into common law? So common law is about you're not happy, then you go to high court, you know, then you have to bring out case studies and see what has been decided before and so on and so forth. So through my research, I realised that as a young nation, we don't even have enough case studies to have a fighting chance to fight, you know. So within a situation where you have accelerated growth and the issues are paramount and employment is the number one priority for all of us, don't you think for any responsible government, they should have st stated some criteria for us so we have a fighting chance under common law? At least state what is the uh, grounds for you to lose your job, at least as basic as that, you know. So our friends, even though their mantra is the objective is for a fair and just society, never bothered. As long as they wash their hands off you, your pasal, you know. So, um, so how, what can how can we move forward? You know, to have um, cases for employees to fight uh, under. Uh, to, to, to be able to um, uh, complain to MOM is a step in the right direction, but I still do not agree with it. It's the same uh, issue of like government trying to use power and they have the final say. It should be an independent body, legislative, separated from executive. So everywhere else in the world, there is this thing called labour court. You know, Singapore supposedly to be first world country, no labour court. Right? Most of our... Concerns are very simple, basic issues like non-payment of salary. Non-payment of salary for one month of salary, you hire $15,000, $20,000 for a lawyer. Most people just wouldn't fight. So because of this unequitability, right? So we became meek, you know, as workers. Became meek as workers. We don't have even have a uh, level ground to even have a adult conversation with their employer. And that's really bad. That's one of the major issues that's actually putting us down. So even before we can get to that uh, level where you can have uh, an equal um, level playing ground where you can have an adult conversation with an employer, I think we should recalibrate uh, the relationship between the ruler and the rule. Right now, we just take their words to be uh, the truth, to be the best for us, uh, during these two speeches, let's talk about it and Taman's uh, speech in, in St. Galan. They use the word, uh, it's a trade-off that we have to accept. That is how PAP controls your mind. They say that if you don't accept the trade-offs, uh, the whole country will disintegrate. But if you look at alternative models, whatever they don't want you to believe in, are actually the models that work. You know, the highest productivity countries in the world, like Germany, for example, have the strongest labor law and they are not confrontational. How do they do it? They have a workers community committee within their own company where you um, elect your uh, colleagues and then you pay your eight dollars. So anything happens, including working too hard. Huh? If somebody is like, having too much overtime, um, the workers' committee will be asking the direct boss, you know, how come this guy is working too hard? Are you not managing the project effectively, you know? So there is a... Um, the thing is, right now, the way it's being run is like, there's no check and balance, you know? It's only a one-way relationship, right? So we need to recalibrate that. So in this German model, it goes through the workers' committee first. If the situation is more serious, then it gets elevated into senior management. Then, if more serious, then it goes to labor union. Then, after that, then court case, you know. So, at least it's not confrontational. I feel that it's a better model for you to have a, uh, a better balanced relationship between um, the three parties. And then, our tripartite definition is also a policy. Tripartite here is about government, workers, and labor unions, right? Government, is it? Employers, employers yeah. yeah. Employers, workers, and government. No, no, no. It's government, employers, and workers. No, no. I think it should be workers, employers, labor unions, and government is regulatory. Right now, it's government, work, employers, and workers. And I don't know what labor union do lah. And organize, organize parties. <laughs> Huh? You know what they do or not? What they do is sort of sell cheerleading parties for the PC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like all the service at $8 you pay to NTUC, you get no service in return. In the end, also, they will give you advice go hire a lawyer, please, you know? 
like hello <laughs> yeah and then all the discounts you get NTUC can never pay back your membership. yeah membership <laughs> for some kangkong and from red chilies you know so uh, so that's the thing um, uh, I think we've been shortchanged uh, our neighboring countries even though they signed FTA have put in better guidelines and better practices to ensure free market competition within their own country we haven't uh, so that's one uh, the issue of this um, globalization and FTA uh, not only is uh, reduce uh, is suppressing us and opportunities itself are not being open to us that will lead to a future structure employment not because we are lousy stupid lazy like the way our government tells us to um, then workers rights thank you